Well, Christian and Martin, thank you very much indeed for those uh, words of introduction. And it's uh, always a pleasure to be in Berlin, particularly when it's a warm day, having just come from Norway, where, as you can imagine, it's about 20 degrees colder, um, or Scotland, where indeed it was snowing uh, only last week. Um, so uh, it's reassuring to know that I gather the temperature is going to drop by 20 degrees by tomorrow uh, in Berlin as well. Uh, Christian, you're quite right. I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to dissect Rule Britannia as, uh, as 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 verse or doggerel. Maybe it's doggerel. Um, I am going to think about Rule Britannia, though, as you rightly suggested, in terms of what does that actually mean, and in terms of its strategic context. Um, because uh, my departure point, for what I want to talk about today is a lecture that was given um, in uh, January 1904 um, at the Royal Geographical Society in London by a man called Halford Mackinder, who was reader in geography at Oxford and director of the London School of Economics. I'm not sure, I mean, academic pluralism is something that I think I can be accused of. Um, I'm still a visiting professor at Glasgow, uh, which is where I supervise Martin. Um, as well as being at Oxford. But I can't quite understand how you could be both a reader in geography at Oxford and simultaneously director of the London School of Economics, unless in 1904 Oxford still decided not to recognize the London School of Economics as a real uh, university or center of learning, which is perfectly possible, I have to say. Anyway, he delivered this lecture, and it was called The Geographical Pivot of History. And what he described was a world which he reckoned had been fully explored and fully politicized. He called the world a closed political system, a point to which I'll return. Um, in other words, the era of exploration, the era of discovery, the era even of colonial subdivision, particularly, of course, of Africa, um, had been completed. He was concerned with what um, our politicians today regard as a new phenomenon, um, totally wrongly, uh, something which they call an increasingly globalized world. At least they do in Britain. There must be a German equivalent. What's the German phrase for an increasingly globalized world? You're more precise about language. I can't see how a world can be increasingly globalized, but what the world is global. Anyway, <laughs> uh, British politicians talk about an increasingly globalized world, and that was sort of the phenomenon that concerned the kingdom. As McKinder put it, every explosion of social forces, instead of being dissipated in a surrounding circuit of unknown space and barbaric chaos, uh, this is not politically correct stuff, will be sharply re-echoed from the far side of the globe. And weak elements in the political and economic organization of the world will be shattered in consequence. The central point of McKinder's lecture <coughs> was his location of the hub of this worldwide political system. What he was not concerned, if you'd spoken to most people before 1914, as to why you should regard the world as increasingly globalized, they would have said, because we have a worldwide banking system, because we have a worldwide trading nexus, because we have 59 states uh, on the gold standard who therefore can trade freely uh, and fully between each other. He saw things differently. He was not concerned with a world that was centered on Western Europe uh, or on London, for example, as the shipping insurance and banking center of, of that nexus. He was not concerned with the states that lay on the Atlantic seaboard. Instead, for him, the geographical pivot lay further to the east it was a place called Euro-Asia. Uh, and while I'm talking about modern residences, that's a bit like Obama talking about this place called AFPAC uh, or Asia Pacific, two other non-existent places in terms of states, uh, if not of uh, uh, geographical entities. Euro-Asia, he said, was the world island, the land mass of 21 million square miles, or as he put it, half of all the land on the globe if we exclude from reckoning the deserts of Sahara and Arabia. And Russia, which of course many people in the decade before the First World War 
as saw as the coming great power, the power with real potential, the power that was going to dominate uh, the world in the 20th century. Uh, Theodor von Holbeck was one of them, but there were plenty of people in Britain as well as in Germany who took that view. Um, Russia was the state at the heart of Euro-Asia. At the dawn of the 20th century, it was the one that had the military and economic opportunity to exploit its central position in this world island. As McKinder put it, transcontinental railways are now transmuting the conditions of land power, and nowhere can they have such effect as in the closed heartland of Euroasia, in vast areas of which neither timber nor accessible stone was available for road making. Railways work the greater wonders in the steppe because they directly replace horse and camel mobility, the road stage of development having been omitted. And of course, as Mackinder uh, spoke at the Royal Geographical Society, uh, the Russian army uh, was preparing uh, to go to Manchuria to fight the Japanese, um, and would travel on the Trans-Siberian Railway to prove his point uh, in order to get there. In other words, a power that was exercising influence in Europe could also, thanks to the railway, exercise influence on the Pacific coastline. Um, for Mackinder, that ability was evidence of mobile land power, just as the British Army's ability to deploy forces to South Africa uh, four years, five years previously, had been evidence of the mobility of sea power. And the conclusion which followed uh, was expressed in terms by Mackinder, which clearly were designed to have a popular effect, designed to capture people's imaginations, designed to hit newspaper headlines. Because what he said in his peroration to his lecture was, who rules East Europe commands the heartland. Who rules the heartland commands the world island. Who rules the world island commands the world. The Kinder's lecture was important for three reasons. First of all, it marked the arrival in the English-speaking world of the study of geopolitics. Uh, this was not a subject which had commanded much attention hitherto. Secondly, it provided an obvious challenge to the prevailing orthodoxy in the British world that power rested on maritime power um, and that, of course, was an argument which had been sustained not just by Britain itself, but across the Atlantic uh, by Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan, who in 1890 had published a book, The Importance of Sea Power Upon History, which had commanded widespread attention in many countries, including, of course, here in Germany, uh, where the Kaiser uh, was at least said to have read it. I wonder how many books the Kaiser actually read, um, but anyway, he was said to have read it. Mackinder uh, set uh, a notion uh, to stand against, set an idea which he saw as standing against that of Mahan. Mahan, uh, according to Mackinder, <coughs> talked about the one and continuous ocean enveloping the divided and insular lands. What, in other words, Mahan had talked about was the sea as dominating land because you could travel anywhere uh, around the world by sea. Uh, Mackinder, on the other hand, uh, was uh, proposing uh, a reverse image, which essentially was that the land power and the continent, particularly the Euro-Asia island, obviously, would dominate the sea. Um, as Mackinder said in his lecture, the whole theory, uh, this idea of Mahan's, of, of the ocean dominating the land underpinned the whole theory of modern naval strategy and policy as expounded by such writers as Captain Mahan and Mr. Spencer Wilkinson. I mention Wilkinson simply because, uh, as well as being then the military correspondent of the Morning Post, a London newspaper, he was soon to be Oxford's first professor of military history, uh, and he was in the audience listening to Mahan as he was delivering his lecture. The third reason that the Kinder's 
uh, argument was important, um, was that the idea that sea power was losing out to land power, that Western uh, Europe was losing out to Central Europe. The third reason was that was important was that that has come to provide a basis for considering the underpinnings of the hostility and ultimately, of course, the war of 1914-1918 and possibly even the war of 1939-45 uh, of the hostility between Britain and Germany. In 1976, uh, Paul Kennedy, um, the historian of the Anglo-German antagonism, uh, but in 1976, that book had not yet been published, although Paul Kennedy was already working on it. Paul Kennedy wrote a book called The Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery. And that book ends part two, uh, which he called Zenith, uh, with a chapter called Mahan versus McKinnon. And after you leave that chapter, Mahan versus McKinnon, part two ends, and you move on to Guess what? Because part two has been called Zenith, to part three, which is called Fall. This is uh, the fall of British naval mastery. Uh, put simply, what Kennedy was arguing was that Mackinder had replaced Mahan. And because Mackinder was right and Mahan was wrong, British power ebbed because it rested on sea power. Kennedy concluded his chapter, which discussed the First World War with these, these words, and this is a quotation from Kennedy. History, Mahan had asserted, has conclusively demonstrated the inability of a state with even a single continental frontier to compete in naval development with one that is insular, although of smaller population and resources. By the 20th century, that's Kennedy quoting Mahan, this is Kennedy, by the 20th century, with the rise of superpowers rich enough to support both a large army and a navy, this was no longer true. Mackinder, as it turned out, had proved to be far more prescient. The point I want to make this afternoon is that Mackinder was not as absolutely right as Paul Kennedy would have us believe. Indeed, what is striking to any casual observer, and I have to say my research on this needs to be more thorough, uh, is how limited the impact of Mackinder's lecture was. Um, it was well attended, there were influential people in the audience, uh, and yet a quick scan of the London press over the next few days does not suggest anybody picked it up. Um, I need to have uh, a more thorough look at the political commentaries in the journals of the day to sustain that point. Um, but it seems extraordinary to me that if people in 1904 felt Mackinder were right, and that actually the main <coughs> underpinning of British power was ebbing, then you would have thought the British political commentators of the day would have responded to that. Moreover, Mackinder was somebody who was well placed to exercise influence. When he'd been an undergraduate at Oxford, he had been president of the <coughs> union. Um, the union at Oxford uh, was then, and still is, uh, a debating society. That is its primary claim to fame. Um, it is where budding young politicians then and now go and cut their teeth uh, by engaging in sometimes rather adolescent antics, but occasionally by, uh, this is being recorded, I've got to watch that, I'm sure the new president of the union today will get on to me and say I'm misrepresenting, introducing uh, the reputation of the, of, of the union of Oxford University, uh, where of course they engage in very serious debates about the state of the nation and its future. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a rite of passage for those who are Oxford undergraduates who aspire uh, to political preferment. The Kinder be president of the Union, and he had stood for Parliament in 1900 as a liberal imperialist. Um, in other words, he had harbored political as aspirations. His lecture in 1904 was attended by Leo Amory. Um, Amory, a, a, an imperialist, 
Amory the man who uh, wished to uh, help develop nations of imperial defense, who recognized that the growth of other European powers, both through industrialization and through the acquisition of navies, uh, threatened, as he saw it, British supremacy uh, in the rest of the world. And Amory, like the Kinder, was associated with groups which advocated imperial efficiency and also the possibility of tariff reform. The idea that Britain might move away from its cherished policy of free trade to some form of protection to give benefit to imperial links um, and discriminate against uh, non-imperial countries. These were groups like the kindergarten, uh, formed by Lord Milner, who had been High Commissioner in South Africa during the South African War, and who would be Secretary of State for War in the second half of the First World War, uh, groups like the Coefficients um, and the Compatriots. They have uh, wonderful titles, these uh, groups. So his lecture by rights ought to have exercised influence on those men of influence with whom he consulted. Uh, men like Joseph Chamberlain, uh, who admittedly uh, was on the retreat by then, who had been Secretary of the State of the Colonies, and Lord Haldane, who would become uh, Secretary of State for War uh, the following year with the formation of the Liberal government, and who would reform the British Army in the approach of the First World War. And as I've said, my overwhelming impression is that the lecture had no influence whatsoever. Why not? Well, if you think about it, to tell a British audience that Britain is in the wrong place in the world, physically, isn't much help. Um, you can't actually take Britain, stop it being an island, and put it in Eurasia, um, which would have been the conclusion uh, that you would naturally draw uh, if you were British from what McKinley was saying. So given that the geographical realities of Britain's position were and are set, the only other solution that was open to his audience was to think through a political solution, or a political way out of this dilemma. How should Britain confront uh, the fact that Eurasia and the rise of the heartland uh, presented a challenge to maritime power? <coughs> How could it offset uh, the growth of continental powers and their arms by making its empire and its navy work more effectively. That, to all intents and purposes, was the question that the kingdom was raising, if you think through the subtext of this, what he was saying. And of course, when you put it in those terms, there was nothing very new about what the kingdom was saying. There was nothing very new because most people in Britain addressed perfectly sensibly and clearly exactly those sort of issues already. Moreover, there was good reason for some of those in uh, Mackinder's audience to be complacent. In 1904, Euroasia was not, in fact, a direct threat to Britain. Because, as Mackinder acknowledged when he spoke, Russia lacked the capital to develop its resource base. The following year, in 1905, Russia would actually be defeated in Manchuria by the Japanese, and revolution would follow. The danger to Britain as a rimland, his phrase for that alternative to the heartland, the danger to Britain as a rimland would be only be manifested if Germany achieved an alliance with Russia, or as Mackinder himself was to argue in the course of the Second World War in 1943, would only arise if the Soviet Union defeated Germany. So at bottom, Mackinder's famous lecture was an endorsement of a policy which Britain was beginning to embrace, which was the need to be more directly involved in the politics of Europe in order to pursue a balance of power on the continent. For Mackinder, France was the obvious counterweight to Russia. And to that extent, uh, what Mackinder was arguing for was an end to British isolation and a greater engagement in European politics. In the course of 1904, Britain would, of course, establish an entente with France, and three years later, in 1907, it would establish a relationship with Russia as well. 